Hi, my name is Jesse Anderson. In this video, I want to share why you should be using binary formats. And this is an important part for data engineering, especially for those who came from a different background, maybe software engineering, maybe data warehousing, where this was taken care of for you. So let me explain why this is so important. So I'm going to do this by way of diagramming out and helping you understand what all of this means. So to start off with, let's kind of go through a, a very common background or two common backgrounds. One is sort of a DBA sort of data warehouse sort uh, background. And in those sorts of backgrounds, often they're using a technology that already supports all these uh, table formats. So they have that database. And in that database, there is all the, there's a columnar format and there's, and there's the relational database. So, so whatever that table format is, NODB, lots of different possibilities there. So there's the there's some sort of table format that handles all this for you. So when in that sort of DBA scenario, they never really had to think about this specifically. It was handled by software for them. Now let's go through another sort of scenario, and that's a software engineer who transitions into data to become a data engineer. So here we have our software engineer and our software engineers are often dealing with data very similar in that database where the database handled it quite frankly. And personally for most of my career, that was what happened. The database just kind of handled it. You put your data in there, didn't really matter, didn't really care what how it was done. But the other way, the other manifestation, and I think it's a source of confusion for people is so what what does this mean what what does uh it mean to use data and that, usually that data is rest calls so you're doing some kind of ajac rest call saving data in some sort of uh format such as json so for them they're used to these let's say web web pages that are reaching out to a server somewhere on the cloud and that form that's a rest call that could be an rpc call remote procedure call and oftentimes those rest calls are in something such as json so to them this is a great way of moving data around and for these sorts of scenarios of hey we're going to make this rest api as open and as easy for people to use as possible json's a great way to do that so completely agree there now, here is the issue that we run into here is that they don't realize that this is different in big data. What they don't realize is that when we go to use and create data products, doing just a schema or schema-less thing such as JSON, that's a problem. So what we're trying to do in, in data as data engineers is we are going to take a data product And here we have our data product. And we need to let the world know about that. We need to let the rest of the company use this. So when we have a data product that is, let's say JSON, the issue with JSON is that several fold. Uh, let's kind of go through them. One is it's called a data type definition or DTD. Uh, there is no built-in mechanism in JSON that says, here is, I've given you this JSON, here's a way to validate it. And that can be a, a, a big issue because you can't say, well, this doesn't conform to what I expect easily. Since JSON is very schemaless, there could be extra fields, there could be fields removed. There's a lot of different possibilities there. And one thing I like to make, I wanna make clear back here on the left, with, with REST, we could do different versions. We could do a version one and we could do a version two and we can do a version three. And each one of these could have different sort of JSON schemas because there was a different URL. So there was, each one of these would be a separate URL and we could have those separate URLs actually go, go to different places, different JSON altogether. But we can't do this here with data products. Well, why not? 
because when we go to set up a data product, we need consistency. We need this data product to be consistently in a place with a consistent schema. And this is where schemas such as JSON really break down. They have a problem is that, yes, we, you might be sitting there thinking, well, yes, you can have a schema. It correlates to this object that I've created in Python, Java, what have you. And that's the problem. You have an object in Python. You have an object in JSON. And now you've made the assumption that everybody else that's downstream of this data product is going to use that same language. So what we really want to do is we want to have a binary format that encapsulates this data product along with schema so that it can describe the schema that is being used here. And this is a big reason why we don't use something like JSON. XML goes into this. That's a key reason. So that schema is a big reason. We can say this schema, this field, so whatever our field is, so we could have a field and we could say that field is an integer. Well, we need that. It's in incredibly important for us to do this in our data products so that that is as readable as possible. But there's a, an even deeper reason behind this, and it's more of a computer science reason. Uh, and that manifests in two ways. So one is in serialization, deserialization. deserialization. So I'm going to, uh, you might see that as certy and this is when you are taking this object. Let's say you did this in JSON. So you're taking and you're reading that entire string into memory and then creating some other object out of that. So this process of to object in memory and that object in memory could be, let's say we're using Python, that could be an, uh, a dict, a dictionary. In Java, that could be a POJO, plain old Java object. But in material of the language, we have this process of serialization and deserialization uh, where we have to take this object. So what we need to do is we need to have a way of doing this consistently but performantly. And the issue with one of the issues with JSON is this performance is not great because you're using a string. So you're doing a lot of mem copies. You're it's highly memory intensive to read all of this in. And if we're using a binary format, such as Avro, Protobuf, that sort of thing, the memory intensiveness of the certy is it's not as bad. There is definitely some mem copy, but the sheer amount of this is now nowhere near as bad. So this creation of the object as a direct result of, of this is far, far faster. And I, I personally haven't looked at the metrics for this uh, at a lot of different places, but some people estimate and some of the uh, operations people and performance people I've talked to have said that between 60 to 70% of our CPU for our jobs, Spark jobs, what have you, is spent right here. It's spent in this serialization, deserialization, rather than in the actual processing of the data. And this, this alone could be a significant reason why your Spark job, for example, is running slowly. You use the wrong one. So when we use our binary formats, we speed up this part. There is also another manifestation to this, and that is just how, how big the data is. So if you're, if you're in big data, you think, well, that's great. I'm in big data. We can do this. But think in your mind about the scheme of, once again, how is, so since we're picking on JSON so much, so what does the schema of JSON looks like? Well, it looks like fields. So we have our field and then in quotes, and then we have some sort of uh, some something inside of that. And then we have another field and so we have lots of these. And if we were to send another one, uh, let's say a few seconds later, or a millisecond later, it's going to have all of this field information in it. So kind of go through in your mind and think, okay, well, just how big is that? So my, my estimate of this repeated schema is somewhere around probably 
50%, maybe higher of the ratio of these fields over and over again to the actual data. So your, your data could be 50% bigger just off the top, just if you're, if you're doing a bunch of, of string data. But let's imagine that you're doing string data and um, numeric data. Well, in JSON, whether that field is numeric or string or whatever, in the file itself, in the way both it's represented on disk, sent across the network, it's still a string. So if you have a number, let's say one, two, three. So here we have our one, two, three. Well, in memory on disk, it is a number one, but it's a an ASCII or a UTF one, number one, UTF number two, UTF number three. There's three bytes taking up on this. And that's an issue because if we're doing lots of large, lots of numbers, this field doesn't need to be this big. Uh, depending on the size, we could actually reduce this down by quite a bit. This number, uh, if we're still, if we're always going to be less than 255 or 128, depending on whether it's signed or unsigned, or it could be a short, so it could be two bytes. We could be using, in this case, three bytes where one byte is sufficient, maybe two bytes are sufficient. And this is key, but you might be thinking, well, it's one byte, who cares? Well, if you're dealing in big data, it's one byte times every row that you have. And if you have 10 billion rows, you have 10 billion extra bytes. And this is where you get into an optimization issue of there's a lot, if you have a, a little bit, but you have a lot of it, if you have a 10 billion rows, small improvements of 10 bytes, 100 bytes, whatever, are always times that number of rows. So a savings of 100 bytes, let's say, in, in this sort of case, well, we could go from, let's say, 100, let's say it's 200 bytes for a JSON payload, and we get that down to 100 bytes, and that's probably on the high side for, let's say, Avro. Well, that isn't just 100 bytes of savings, it's 100 bytes times 10 billion, if you have 10 billion rows. And that can mean a significant reduction. That significant reduction manifests in our storage. So how, how costly is it for us to store that in S3, whatever our blob storage is? We can reduce that, we can reduce that, and then we can have our, uh, and this usually isn't stored just in one place. This is usually stored in S3 and in a database. Perhaps there's a lot of different places that, that can be stored. Uh, it could be in a topic, so it could be in a Kafka or Pulsar topic. There's a lot of different places where this data moves, and by those reductions, we're sending that, we're reducing that, but if we're using a real-time a pub sub, that reduction is also times the number of consumers. So each one of those consumers consumes 100 bytes less. And that can, be, that can add up pretty significantly in terms of time, in terms of storage. So if we don't, if we store it less, if we store less, then we can actually have our topics store 14 days instead of 10 days, for example. There's some real benefit right here. There's a follow-on to this, is that when we go to store data, things that are in JSON versus something that is binary, such as Avro, that stores better when compressed. So if we're using a compression, zip compression, LZMA compression, snappy compression, snappy will compress this better than your JSON. That's just the way they work. They're looking for patterns. The patterns can be found much easier and much better in binary than they can be in JSON. So if you were to look at an overall sort of comparison compressed, you're looking at even lower numbers. So maybe that 100 bytes, once it's compressed, could go down to, let's say, 75. It could come down to 60. There's there's a few different possibilities there. But 
by leveraging all of this, it has a cumulative effect. So by removing JSON and going to binary, we now get our fields that go from 200 bytes down to 100 bytes that we then compress and get down. So all of this really provides us with a way of, of reducing things, but not just reducing storage, that reduce costs, but it also reduces the amount of time all of this takes. So hopefully this is a good sort of look at why these binary formats are so important. And although I talked about Avro more, more often, there are a few different possibilities. We can use Avro, uh, that's a common big data format. Uh, we could use protobufs, there are people that use that. The issue there is that there aren't as good of uh, support out there in the ecosystem for protobufs. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Parquet. No, one thing to know about Parquet is that it's an on-disk format that isn't an in-memory format. So it will on-disk save in binary, but in memory, it is up to the framework that's actually reading that into memory of how to do that. But these are a few possibilities, but really this is a key part of what it takes to go from in perhaps a software engineer, DBA, into truly a data engineer who understands this and understands the possibilities. Thank you for watching, and I hope this was helpful.